your ultimate guide on your next Welcome to Philosophy Hub Research University, your ultimate guide on your next research project. We will lay down the best practices in research ideation, literature review, experimental design, and data analysis to guide you as you carry out your research project. Learn from the PhilSci Hub team of research scientists and some invited subject matter experts. PhilSci Hub Research University will be your personal coach through every stage of your research project from ideation to final assessment. And the best part, it's absolutely free. Visit us at philsci-hub.com and be part of this learning journey. Let's learn and succeed together here at Philsci Hub Research University. With Squarespace, editing and adding pieces on my e-commerce site is Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Ako po ay si Dr. Chester L. Davalos, isang agricultural chemist. Magkakasama po tayo sa pagtuklas ng iba't ibang uri ng yamang agrikultura. Halina't matuto at mag-investiga sa paluntun ng agrika pa! Sa harino, sa bukit man, ang atanong ninyo ay dadaanan. Mga halaman at ibang yaman, mga sekretong tatandaan o agrika pa. Narito po tayo ngayon sa aming hardin upang talakayin ang tatlo sa mga gulay na ginagamit sa pagluto ng singgang. Maalala niyo po ba yung composting na giniskas ko sa aking episode 1? Itok na po ngayon, ginanang ko po siya ng pechay at labanos ang mga crucifers na ating tatalakayin sa ating diskurso. Sa panahon malamig ang simoy ng hangin, wala nang hihigit pa kundi ang paghigop ng mainit na sabaw ng singgang. Ang sinigang ay pinapaasim ng katas ng sampalok. O kung kayo'y naman ay nahihirapang manugkit ng sampalok, po pwede naman po ang ready mix flavor na lang. Ang ating pagtatalakay ngayon ay tungkol sa mga gulay na pwedeng isahog sa sinigang. Ito ay ang pechay, labanos, at ang sili. Ang sili ay may dalawang klase. Po pwedeng gamitan natin ng maanghang, o dili kaya yung hindi gaanong maanghang. Ang pechay at labanos ay kabilang sa mga halamang tinaguriang crucifer. Crucifer ang tawag sa kanila gawa ng cross-like arrangement ng kanilang mga dahon. Ang crucifers ay mainam na panlaban ng cancer. Kung pagbabatayin natin ang bilang ng cancer sa mga ethnic groups, mababa po ang bilang ng cancer sa bansang Japan at Korea. Mahilig po kasi silang kumain ng mga crucifers gaya ng pechay at labanos. Umpisa na natin ang ating pag-aaral. Ang pechay ay sagana sa phytochemicals na indole carbonyl at isothiocyanates. Matatagpuan din ang mga compounds na ito sa repolyo at mga salads tulad ng araw. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Welcome to the Filipino Science Hub. Thank you for your continued support to this online platform. To our new participants, thank you for checking us out today, and we would like to officially welcome you to the Fils I Have family. So bago po tayo magsimula, I would like to share some house rules in order to facilitate a smooth session for everyone. For our Zoom participants, we would appreciate it if you could turn your audio and video cameras off during the webinar. If you have questions or comments, feel free to type them on our Zoom chat box or YouTube live comments, and we will try to accommodate as much questions and comments as possible. After the talk, we will have a 30-minute Q&A where the Zoom participants will have the opportunity to ask their questions live. We would also like to request for everyone to not record the webinar. The full video of the session will be posted on our official YouTube channel. For those who would like to receive a certificate of participation, a Google form link will be posted on our Zoom chat box, YouTube live comments, and YouTube video description towards the end of the webinar. Please make sure that you enter the correct information, especially your email address. 
to ensure receipt of the e-certificate. Also, for you to obtain the certificate, you will need to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as follow our page on Facebook. Please note that we receive hundreds of requests and it takes around seven days or so to process all the certificates. If you do not receive your certificate after a week, please feel free to send us a message on Facebook or email us at philsciHub at gmail.com. So again, welcome po sa PhilSciHub. Welcome to all our Zoom participants and our YouTube live viewers. For those who are new and may not be familiar with who we are and what we do, allow me to share our mission and vision in the next few minutes. Filipino Science Hub is an online platform founded by our CEO, Filipino scientist, Dr. Jeffrey Camacho Bunkin, back in 2012. Currently, we are a registered nonprofit organization based in Houston, Texas, United States. Our mission is to promote STEM education and the culture of research among students and teachers in the Philippines and abroad. Our current global leadership team is comprised of volunteer Filipino scientists and seasoned STEM educators from different parts of the world. Our vision is to see a technology and innovation driven Philippines. And we believe that this can be achieved by creating a new generation of well-rounded Filipino STEM enthusiasts. This vision is being carried out by our two major programs, the Philsci Hub Ed Program and Philsci Hub Research University. Through Philsci Hub Ed, we are able to empower and support our teachers when it comes to strengthening STEM fundamentals education. We believe that this is important because the more equipped our STEM educators are, the more they can inspire our students to pursue a career in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Through this program, we have been able to serve our teachers by creating STEM teaching modules, as well as conducting teachers training webinars, all of which are accessible on our website for free. So we have also been able to collaborate with major educational organizations that have the same goals and advocacies as Filipino Science Hub. Through these partnerships, we have been able to further expand our reach and help more students and teachers, especially during the time of pandemic. So together, everybody achieves more. The other major program that drives our vision forward is Filsai Hub Research University. We believe that in order to strengthen a STEM culture, students also need to be able to learn how to conduct a scientific research. As we know, many scientific and technological breakthroughs happened through research. And we would like to equip our younger generation by providing them proper scientific research training. So ikanapo start them young. Here at Philsci Hub Research University, we provide free courses on fundamentals of scientific research, such as research ideation, literature review, how to write a research proposal, how to communicate your research work to the scientific community, among other courses. Through this program, we are also able to bring practicing scientists closer to the STEM educational sector. So because of this closer contact, our students become more aware of the possible STEM career paths available for them and how these careers contribute to the advancement of the society around them. So up to date, we have been able to reach over 70,000 students and teachers all over the world. And we know that this will continue to grow in the years to come. And this is why we are all very excited on what is in store here at Bills I Hope. Our official website is www.fieldsihub.com. This is where you can access all our materials such as webinars, tutorials, modules, virtual lab, and special features. We are also present in several social media platforms such as Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and TikTok. So follow us wherever you're most active on to get updated with our web events. So again, thank you for being with us this morning. And to officially start our webinar, 
I would like to turn the virtual floor over to our host for today. Yan muli po magandang umaga sa ating lahat sa ating mga Zoom participants and YouTube live viewers. Welcome to the Filipino Science Hub. So, bago po natin simulan officially ang ating webinar, I would like to welcome Dr. Anna Karen Lacerna uh, to share share the uh, the goals, uh, the purpose of this collaboration with Center of Instrumentation Facility at De La Salle University. So, Ma'am Karen. Okay, uh, maraming salamat, Dindi, and uh, magandang umaga po sa lahat ng nag-join uh, who, who are with us in this um, webinar for today. And so, um, I just wanted to introduce a bit about um, De La Salle University Central Instrumentation Facility. Um, I would just share my screen for a bit. Okay, so um, this are so we are a, an instrumentation facility based in uh, Binyan Laguna. So we are part of the De La Salle University Manila Laguna campus. So we're based in George SKT building of um, the LSU Laguna campus, and we have this uh, various instrumentations that are available. So we have um, an NMR lab, spectroscopy, um, chromatography, integrated electron microscopy. Uh, we have instrumentations also in terms of like uh, for use in imaging and cell culture lab, as well as we have um, in in um, in uh, it, it, it's being built like uh, it's it's being um, prepared the wind tunnel testing laboratory. So we are very happy um, to uh, partner with Philsci Hub in their um, uh, goal of promoting STEM education as well as research here in the Philippines. And that is actually also part of our um, objective to be able to share um, knowledge about these various in analy analytical instrumentation and hopefully collaborate and um, serve um, our researchers and students uh, here in the Philippines. So this is the first actually of a webinar series. So we have this webinar series on um, modern analytical methods uh, in collaboration with Philsci Hub. So uh, we will start off with Mr. Chris Argamino uh, speaking about uh, atomic and molecular spectroscopy for environmental research. We will subsequently have um, Dr. Jose Esmeria Jr. to speak on ele integrated electron microscopy. Um, Dr. Virgilio Ebajo, uh, who will be presenting on NMR spectroscopy for natural products research. Um, Mr. Michael Arnante, who will be presenting on cytogenetics analysis. And I will also be uh, presenting on uh, liquid chromatography in terms of applications to natural products research. So you can see uh, we have, um, we will be able to uh, provide and share um, knowledge on the foundational aspects of this instrumentation um, capabilities and also um, share with you applications, saan ba pwedeng gamitin yung mga um, instrumentation na to. Um, and lastly, we also wanted to share about how can we uh, prepare our samples for these types of um, analytical, ana uh, sorry, in instrumentational analysis. Kasi syempre, um, it's, in it's important uh, for us uh, before these things are analyzed they have to be well prepared uh, to ensure your integrity no results and no analysis and so we would like to educate our um, students and researchers about this as well so we hope that um, you will join us in this uh, webinar series uh, we are lo very much looking forward to sharing um, what we have in terms of the instrumentation as well as with uh, what we know about these instruments uh, with everyone here in who are in at, who are attending this Philsci Hub uh, webinar series. So thank you again to Philsci Hub for allowing us to uh, partner with them uh, for this um, series of webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karen, for making this collaboration happen and we are also grateful to be able to partner up with your team. So 
Kaya nga po nang sinabi ni Ma'am Karen kanina, today will be will be the very first lecture on this webinar series on modern analytical methods. So sa mga kaka-join lang, welcome po again sa ating webinar. So Mr. Chris Ar Chris Argamino will be speaking about atomic and molecular spectroscopy for environmental research. So it's my honor po to give a little bit of a background about Mr. Chris Argamino. So currently he's a faculty member at De La Salle University. And prior to that, he worked at Shimadzu Philippines Corporation as an application chemist. So ngayon po, he is finishing up his Doctor of Philosophy in Environmental Science at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. And he got his Master of Science in Environmental Science and Ecosystem Management at De La Salle University. So in terms of instrumentation expertise, he is well-versed in the following instrumentation. UV visible spectro spectrophotometer with reflectance, Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, attenuated total reflection or what we commonly call FTIR, ATR, particle size and zeta potential analyzer, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer or ICPMS and elemental analyzer. So without further ado, po, I give the virtual floor over to Mr. Chris. Mr. Chris, take it away. Sa po naman tayo kung narinig niyo po ako. Nakikita niyo po ba yung reaction portion sa inyo? Okay, sir. Okay, pa. Pwede na po natin. Ganda kong makikris agapes yung Central Instrumentation Facility. At uh, ngayong umaga po pag-uusapan natin yung mga application ng, ano, ng atomic at molecular spectroscopy sa environmental research. Okay. So napakarami po kasing applications ng spectroscopy in general at uh, mag-focus tayo ngayong umaga doon sa environmental research. Para yung konsepto na uh, o yung mga information na matutunan natin today ay magagamit niya rin naman sa iba pang mga klase ng mga sample or urban types ng research pertaining to uh, these techniques. Okay. So ako po ay uh, kasalukuyan din nag-aaral ng uh, environmental science sa uh, UPNS. So uh, unang yugto ng ating presentation today ay uh, chichika muna tayo. So gusto ko malaman yung uh, inyong mga uh, opinion tungkol sa kasalukuyang uh, lagay ng environmental issue sa Pilipinas. So paki-scan lang po itong ano, uh, QR code or baka pwedeng yung i-type din yung menti.com tapos type natin yung code na 32370782. So bago tayo mag-proceed doon sa medyo technical na course ng ating uh, presentation today. So atayin ko po yung mga sagot niya. So meron na kong sumagot na isa. Dalawa. So, medyo dumadami na. Ipipresent natin ngayon yung, ano, no, yung screen. So, hopefully na, ano nyo po, na-picture nyo na to, yung code. Uh, ilipat ko na muna ngayon yung pag-share ng screen doon sa uh, mga sagot nyo sa, sa menti. Nakikita niyo po ba ngayon yung screen? Sa... Ayan, so... Ayan. So number one, yung pollution, no? This management. And then, mga ilan-ilan may mga sumasagot ng mga climate change, so yung waste management na related din naman. Ayan. Sige po. So yun yung una nating tanong, no? Uh, maraming salamat sa pagsagot. 
um, yung second question naman natin would be uh, this one. So, and so among the environmental issues, uh, which one uh, do you think uh, can be addressed or may type of by applying chemistry concepts? So, galing dun sa mga, ano, mga nakita nyo kanina na uh, mga problema na identify ng mga viewers natin. So, which do you think can be addressed by chemistry concepts? All, yan. Di naman. Warming waste management, pollution. So, marami rin yung sumasagot ng uh, waste management, so, microplastics, testing, and Okay, so, and maraming salamat sa pag-participate po, no, sa ating um, munting, ano, uh, pa-survey. Yeah. So, balik na tayo ngayon dun sa aking uh, presentation. So, dun sa nabanggit nyo kanina, um, talagang, ano, uh, malaking iso yung waste management, no, or pollution sa ating um, kapaligiran dito sa, ano, sa Pilipinas. So, hindi, na, hindi natin sinasabi na hindi problema yung ibang mga issues no or hindi ganoon kalaki yung problema like uh, climate change kasi definitely na nararamdaman naman talaga natin pero um actually ma maganda rin na malaman na uh, na pollution yung identify kasi may may relate natin sa no sa spectroscopy na topic uh, this morning so sa kalawang yung tunong presentation uh usapan muna natin current state so hindi sa masyadong current kasi ang basis natin would be the ano no the um uh dito reports ng DNR na pinaka recent so I, I tried to get the recent um situationers doon sa kanilang website so unahin muna natin yung uh kasalukuyang nangyari din yung covid-19 at um uh, environmental monitoring so medyo obvious din na kung bakit nag-improve yung NCR air quality ito ay galing doon sa executive summary ng annual report ng DNR uh Pero everything else na uh, nagkaroon ng problema. So, pasensya na nabaliktad ko. Water quality monitoring dahil hindi nga nakakalabas, sumaba ito. Yung PPE waste, kumaas. At yung sanitary landfill monitoring activities, kumaba rin dahil hindi nakakalabas. So, malaki yung nag-effect nito doon sa uh, data na nakalap ng ating uh, ahensya. Uh, with uh, respect to the uh, environment natin. Uh. So... Pertaining to water quality naman, ito medyo lumang report ng Water Environment Partnership in Asia. So, 2.2 million metric tons of organic pollution yung produce natin. Tapos kung makikita natin dito, uh, madalas siguro nakikita natin na galing sa mga industry, galing sa mga factory yung pollution. Pero kung titignan natin itong statistics na to, ang laki ng porsyento ng uh, waste, organic waste, na nanggagaling sa mga domestic sources o mga kabahayan. Pangalawa naman, water pollution dominated nga ng domestic industrial sources. No? So, untreated kasi siya. So, napakalaking issue rin sa Pilipinas yung uh, wala tayong ano, um, kahit nasa batas na, nasa Clean Water Act na, hindi pa rin institutionalized or wala pa rin, uh, wala pa rin tayong matinong uh, municipal uh, uh, solid waste treatment or sewage treatment facility aside from the sanitary issue, no? sanitary landfill issue. Tapos buko, uh, dahil dito, talagang hindi natin, uh, nahihirapan tayong i-address yung mga health outbreak pa minsan-minsan sa mga lugar na um, kung saan nangyayari itong uh, pollution na to. So, pangalawa, susunod naman yung uh, report ng 2013. So, ito yung pinaka-recent na nakita ko dun sa website ng DNR. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, only 28% ng water bodies natin yung ano, uh, nagko-conform dun sa tinatawag na to. Sige, may kita kayo na parang may mga nakalutang sediments. So, kapag medyo mataas yung total suspended solids. Uh, only 27% naman nung uh, na-monitor yung ano, may... Uh, tumaap pumasok doon sa kriteria ng phosphate saka nitrate. So ito ay indication din ng pollution na tumataas kapag uh, malaki yung volume ng ano ng mga organic pollutants especially mga domestic na uh, napupunta sa mga ilog natin. And then monitoring this also that half of the eight water bodies monitored for cyanide. So supposedly dapat hindi na to na ano no, hindi na to factor pero apparently noong 2013 ay nai-report pa rin. Um, for heavy metals, 83% um, 
nung mga minonitor ay ni tawag dito pumasa doon sa mercury 44% lang sa cadmium so yung kabila ay yung ano nito yung uh, iba naman ay bumagsak and then sa uh, lead naman buti na lang at noong 2013 ay nagcomply naman tayo so yun yung mga kinaharap nating uh, sitwasyon ng water quality noong 2013 sa 2013 report so noong 2015 report naman ng air quality uh, ng DNR Uh, nakita natin dito, may kita natin dito na karamihan ng pulos na gagaling talaga sa mga sakyan, sa mobile sources. Okay? So, dahil sa data na to, may kita natin na mukhang kailangan pa talaga natin i-improve yung, ano, yung ating uh, mga regulasyon, mga batas tungkol sa um, pulos na nagagaling sa mga mobile sources like vehicles. So, stationary mga factories, for example, 21% area sources like construction, mga open... Uh, open burning na bawal according to Clean Air Act supposedly, uh, din naman 14%. So aside from that, in terms of uh, physician naman ng mga, ano, ng mga pollutant, meron tayong mga volatile organic carbon, uh, hindi na nakalagay yung prosyento, no? uh, meron din tayong mga SOX, NOX, uh, carbon monoxide, at syempre yung particulate matter natin. So sa, in terms of particulate matter naman, medyo atrasado yung Pilipinas kasi, um, ang nasa cleaner act natin na hindi pa nare-revise mula 1999 ay PM10 pa lang. So yung 10 microns. So mas baba doon yung PM2.5 na minamonitor sa ibang bansa, hindi pa sa masyadong namamonitor sa uh, Pilipinas. Okay? So yun yung estado. Sa forestry naman, ayan, medyo malaki-laki yung ano, uh, nawala sa sampung taon. So in ten, ito ay galing sa Global Forest Watch. In 2010, Philippines had 13.2 uh, mega hectares of natural forest. Uh, no 2020 naman na lose tayo ng 46.8 kilohectares ng no natural forest na yun. So tuloy-tuloy yan na uh, nababawasan habang nahihirapan tayong mag, ano, mag-monitor ng ano, uh, lagging activities at iba pang mga issues related to deforestation. So um, may, actually bukod sa ano, bukod dun sa pag-lose ng forest lands natin, ang malaking epekto rin talaga nito yung contribution ng Pilipinas sa climate change. Kasi um, tinuturing natin ng mga natural uh, carbon sinks itong ating mga kagubatan. Okay? So yun yung estado ng ating, uh, or in, in addition pala, so isa sa mga medyo hot topics na yun, yung tinatawag na ano, uh, plastic emissions. So hindi ako sigurado kung napansin nyo na ito or nakita nyo na ito sa Facebook uh, ng mga nakaraang buwan, pero may isang study na ginawa si Major et al. earlier this year na percent of uh, global riverine plastic emissions in the ocean. So nakakatuwa, hindi pala nakakatuwa ang isipin na uh, 17 doon sa top 50 na tawag dito uh, river plastic emitters sa oceans ay galing sa Pilipinas. So may kita nyo sa slide, nakahighlight yung mga ilog na matagpuan sa Pilipinas na, na doon sa ranking na yun. So ang laki ng iso talaga natin doon sa plastic pollution. Yun. Okay, so... Uh, dahil doon, um, ano ba yung ano ano ba yung mga pwede nating gawin para ma-address to mga issue na to. So yung mga tools na ipapakita natin ngayon sa ngayong umaga, hindi lang siya yung exclusive no na mga tools na pwede nating gamitin pero kahit paano pwede siyang makatulong or di kaya pwede mo siyang gamitin um, in addition to other um, research tools equipment uh, to address these uh, issues. So basics muna tayo para sa uh, kaalaman ng lahat. So konting review kung ano ba yung spectroscopy. So pag sinabing spectroscopy, pinag-aaralan natin dito yung interaction no, ng matter sa radiated energy. So pag sinabing radiated energy, uh, pinag-usapan natin dito yung uh, mga electromagnetic waves. So meron tayong slide mamaya para ipakita yung mga yun. Ngayon, ang tanong na lang dyan, pag na-emit, nag, kapag emit ka ng radi- uh, radiated, ener- radiated energy, may wavelength, no? So yung wavelength na yun, ang tanong dyan, paano magre-react yung matter? doon sa specific wavelength na yun na inimit ng iyong uh, radiation source. So yun yung pinag-aaralan sa spectroscopy in general. Ngayon, um, maraming klase no, ng spectroscopy. Actually, hindi lang sa field ng chemistry ito nagagamit. Nagagamit din siya sa ibang mga field like um, yung mga tinatawag na ano, uh, LIDAR para sa, ano, sa remote sensing, etc. So uh, spectroscopy rin yung konsepto na ginagamit doon sa satellite imaging, etc. Pero... Siyempre ngayong umaga, pag-usapan natin yung ano, uh, at the atomic and molecular level. So nakamarka dito sa slide natin ngayon kung ano ba yung mga 
topic na ipofocus natin ngayong umaga. So meron tayong EAS, ICP, XRF, uh, UVBs, FTIR. Ito yung mga klase ng uh, atomic and molecular spectrometers. So for most discussions, so application ng spectro, pinag-usapan natin dito yung ano, ayun nga again, electromagnetic radiation considered as an electromagnetic wave traveling at the speed of light. So most likely na nakita niyo na to dati itong or maraming ano, familiar din kayo dun sa mga nandito. Pero bigyan natin ng konting uh, uh, deta detalye pa no yung electromagnetic uh, ano natin uh, radiation saka yung yung uh, graph na to. So makita natin dito na pag mas mataas yung wavelength, mas mababa yung kanyang energy. At napakaimportante ng uh, relationship na to kasi ito yung magdidikta rin kung ano ba yung magiging response ng matter. Ano ba magiging response ng electron ng atom doon sa wavelength na inexpose mo sa kanya. So makita natin dito rin na kapag for example, yung pinakapamilya sa atin would be x-ray siguro no. So yung x-ray, since shorter yung kanyang wavelength, ibig sabihin din noon, mas mataas yung energy ng kaya niyang uh, yung nabitbit niya. So iba rin, uh, meron meron kinalaman yun mamaya, makita nyo doon sa response ng ating atom. Samantalang yung radio waves naman, on the uh, other side of the spectrum, medyo mahina. So hindi natin i-discuss ngayon yung radio frequency o radio waves. Pero sa um, session ni Dr. Ibaho, aking kasamahan sa CIF, uh, papaliwanag niya kung ano yung uh, kinalaman nito doon sa tinatawag na ano naman, isang klase action ng spectroscopy, yung NMR, na hindi natin sasakupin ngayong umaga. So may very special um, lecture sa on that later on in a few months. Okay? So ito yung ano, medyo chem portion or physics portion ng mga bagay-bagay, yung mga pinag-usapan kanina. So may kita natin dito na maraming klase ng ano, maraming tawag or iba-iba yung tawag doon sa response ng matter, doon sa radiation. So may tinatawag tayong absorption, fluorescence, phosphorescence, meron din namang vibration. So, para mas mapailawanag ng mabuti, ito yung response ng uh, atom natin or ng matter natin. No? So, pag meron tayong ultraviolet and visible radiation, ang gina medyo malakas na no? kasi nandito siya. No? So, medyo shorter yung wavelength niya and then uh, medyo malakas yung kanyang signal na bitbit -bit or energy na bitbit. -bit. Ang nangyayari dun, um, kapag inabsorb ng electron or ng matter yung, yung atom yung specific wavelength na yun, ang tendency is mapatalsik yung electron na yun, or tumatalon siya actually dun sa next uh, energy level. So yung energy yung re-release, yun yung detect ng makina. Kapag naman X-ray, actually mas malakas yung X-ray dun sa ultraviolet, uh, instead na yung outer electron yung uh, kanyang pinupuntirya, yung inner electron. So pag napuntirya yung inner electron, bababa naman yung ano, uh, electron dun sa outer motion para ma-stabilize yung um, atom mo. Tapos yung energy na release, ganun din. Yun yung minomonitor or yung detect ng makina and then yung infrared in comparison dito sa dalawang to medyo mahina so instead na paghiwalayin sila or magkaroon ng separation doon sa electron o ako ano man ang nangyayari lang ay uh, nagwa-vibrate lang so makita natin dito sa previous slide nagwa-vibrate yung mga bonds so instead na ang ponteria yung atom mismo uh, nasa bonds yung ating uh, bonds lang between atoms yung ating napapagalaw okay So ano ba yung mga basic components ng mga makina ito na tinutukoy natin? So yung kanina yung konsepto, mamaya papakita natin yung mga makina. Pero bago yun, uh, pakita muna natin yung mga parts no? para mas maintindihan natin kung paano sila gumagana. So since uh, pinag-uusapan natin dito yung spectrophotometry, pag sinabing photo meron kang light source most, uh, most of the time, uh, or most likely meron kang radiation source, meron kang wavelength selector. Uh, sampling device kung saan mo nilalagay yung sample mo, meron kang detector na sumasagap nung tumagos na light from that sample and then meron ka rin output device kung saan mo may kita ng reading yung resulta mo. Okay? So punta naman tayo ngayon sa ikaapat na ito ng ating presentation which is uh, focus on atomic spectroscopy. So pag sinabing atomic, uh, pinag-uusapan natin dito yung atoms mismo na yun yung na-analyze natin. Ngayon ang tanong dyan, uh, paano natin na sisiguro na talagang atom lang yung na-analyze natin. Halimbawa, uh, meron kang uh, lupa na sample. Gusto mong i-analyze yung sabihin na lang natin na lead content ng lupa. No? So paano natin masisiguro na talagang, ano, talagang uh, lead lang yung ma-analyze? And daming laman ng lupa, most likely, di ba, may organic components ka, may iba-iba kang metal, heavy sa light. So ang paraan para gawin yun or para maisiguro na talagang atom yung na-analyze would be yung 
introduction ng sample mo sa high temperature. So halimbawa ng mga uh, makina na pwedeng gamitin para sa atomic analysis or elemental analysis ay yung AAS, atomic absorption, or yung tinatawag na inductively coupled plasma naman sa kabilang banda. So ang kaibahan nila, mas mataas lang yung temperature ng inductively coupled plasma sa AAS, sinasubject mo yung sample mo uh, into ano, around 3,000 to uh, 4,000 degrees Celsius. So yung flame na to, nagawa sa air sa acetylene sa yung typical na sa typical na setup, nasa 3,000 degrees Celsius. Ha. So imagine niyo yung uh, sample nyo, usually in liquid form natin sa pinapapasok. No? Talagang pagdating dun sa flame natin, atom na nang matitira kasi napakataas ng temperature. Sa ICP naman, inductively coupled plasma, instead na flame, gumagamit sa ng plasma, ang advantage ng plasma or ionized gas. So mas most likely uh, most of the time ginagamit argon. No? So ang difference naman nito, mas mataas ang temperature niya. Maabot siya ng 10,000 Kelvin. Okay, compared din sa 3,000 ng AAS. And then meron tayong uh, tinatawag na XRF. So hindi kailangan laging nasa ano eh, nasa liquid form. So meron ding paraan para malaman yung elemental composition ng mga sample niyo na hindi mo sinisira ng sample. So at isang tool pwede para magawa mo yon yung tinatawag na XRF or X-ray fluorescence. Meron mga tinatawag na handheld, meron din namang yung a table top yung ginagamit sa lab. Kung nakakita na kayo siguro ng balita dati na yung FDA ay may report na mataas yung uh, sa mga nating lead content ng mga uh, laruan sa divisoria. So paano kaya nila nalaman agad yun? No? Ang ginamit nila most likely ito kung nag-inspection sila ng on the spot. Kasi itong makinang to, itong handheld na XRF, kaya siya gamitin sa field. So may kita mo agad dun sa screen niya yung result ng analysis. Okay. So ito yung uh, block diagram ng mga makinang binanggit ko kanina. So ito yung mga parts sa loob. So mahalaga rin kasi na malaman natin kung ano ba yung mga nasa loob nito. Hindi na kung paano sila gumagana. Para mas maintindihan natin kung ano ba yung mga uh, pwede maka-apekto sa analysis natin at kung paano ba dapat i-prepare yung mga sample. Kasi yung sige feeling ko yung uh, common misconception natin bilang researchers, especially kapag hindi pa tayo exposed sa mga makina, pag nakita natin sa, let's say, sa research natin na ay gumamit sila ng AAS, gumamit sila ng UV-based HPLC para dito sa sample na to. Inaakala natin na pagpadala natin ng sample, mapatubig man yan, lupa man yan, o sabihin na lang natin isda, so malaman yung kung contaminated ba sa ng mercury, etc. Akala natin, pagpadala natin, uh, mamagicin na no? No, no, ng mga chemists, ng mga analyst. So, uh, hindi siya ganun kasimple. So, mamaya may kita natin yung, ano, yung may floor sa atin, uh, parang overview lang, para may idea lang kayo kung ano yung ginagawa ba talaga. And then, at the same time, itong diagram na ito, pinapakita natin bago ma-analyze yung sample. So, sa EAS, uh, may kita natin mamaya, merong, ano, meron tayong may kita na iba-ibang klase ng atomization chamber. Ito yung pinaka-heart ng AAS, no? Kasi dito nangyayari yung pagko-convert nung sample mo into atoms. Sa ICP, medyo similar siya, pero may konting kaibahan dun sa ibang parts. Kasi ang pinaka-advantage ng ICP over AAS, kaya niyang uh, sabay-sabay na i-analyze lahat ng metals mo. Uh, sa, sa libro or sa brochure ng mga supplier, usually 70 elements or more. Um, simultaneously. So imagine kung gaano kabilis yun compared dun sa AAS na talagang pa isa isa yung analysis ng bawat element. Okay. So yun yung advantage sa kaya kung nakikita nyo yung mga quotations siguro kung magpa-quote kayo mas mahal siya. So flame AAS naman, dalawa yung main, ano no, main na uh, uh, atomization chamber na ginagamit, dalawang klase. So yung typical na meron sa mga lab would be the flame AAS. So mas mataas yung concentration na kaya nyo basahin. No? Ang detection limit na ay nasa PPM level. Samantalang kung mas uh, mababa yung concentration na gusto mong hanapin o gusto mong makita doon sa iyong sample, kailangan mong gumamit ng graphite furnace AAS naman. So parts per billion sa. So ibang setup to. So may mga laboratory, testing lab siguro, or mga uh, research facilities na flame lang meron. Iba naman graphite lang, pero may mga setup din na parehong existing yung dalawang uh, atomization chamber na to. Okay. So next naman yung ICP. So medyo similar siya, no? Pero yun nga lang, instead na flame, instead na mga bakal-bakal yung nakikita natin na parts. So kasi medyo mas bakal-bakal yung setup, eh. Dito mas, ano, uh, glass tayo, no? Quartz, in, in, in fact, quartz. Kaya medyo mas may kamahalan yung makina at yung uh, maintenance din niya. 
kasi quartz yung ginagamit. Pero yung, actually, ang maganda sa dalawang techniques na to, halos pareho yung preparation. Kung paano mo piniprepare yung samples mo sa AAS, halos ganun din dito. Uh, with the advantage nga na simultaneous yung, pagpa, yung pag-a-analyze mo ng mga, ano, mga elements. So, ito yung ICP uh, setup natin for the stabilization chamber. And so, next naman would be uh, yung XRF natin. Itong technique na to, in all honesty, hindi ko siya masyadong gamay kasi hindi ko siya naggamit before sa previous work. Pero, um, mas, mas, mas simple siya in general. Hindi na lang siguro masabi ko na mas simple siyang gamitin and then kapag medyo mataas ang concentration nyo, nabanggit ko kanina, di ba, PPM tsaka PPB level, pag mas mataas ang concentration ng mga sample natin, uh, talagang ano, um, mas mainam siguro na gamitin ito kasi hindi nga sinisira yung sample mo number one saka kaya mong mag-analyze at the percent level ng concentration. So halimbawa, um, yung mga minahan natin, sa mga sa, sa mga minahan natin hindi na sila masyado na prefer ng mga technique na binanggit ko kanina syempre gusto nila malaman no kung gaano ba kalaki yung concentration ko taas yung concentration ng mga minimina nilang uh, metals doon sa mga sites so instead na AAS or ICP ginagamit nila mas pini-prefer nila ito kasi especially kapag mataas naman yung concentration ng let's say nickel gold ganyan kasi mas mabilis yung analysis so mamaya papakita natin kung paano paano siya uh, ginagamit no So actually ito lang sa ito yung pinaka sample holder niya. Hindi mo na kailangan i-digest yung sample. So yun yung pinaka advantage niya. Wala na masyadong preparation na kailangan aside from um yung tinatawag na pagpelletize ng ng ano, sample o pagko-compress sa kanya dito sa sample cup na to. So yung um uh, meron tayong slide dito on the ano on the uh, comparison ng mga tekni- techniques na binanggit ko kanina no. So um kailangan nating malaman or kailangan nating ma-identify kung ano ba yung target natin no na concentration ng mga elements or ng mga metals doon sa mga samples natin kasi uh, iba-iba silang tinatawag na detection limit so halimbawa um, gusto mong mag-analyze ng um, mga heavy metal sa tubig sa rivers for example so malaman kung gaano kataas yung level ng pollution o kung meron ba in the first place so makita natin dito sa graph na uh, yung flame AAS na sa PPB to, no? so 100 ppm, pag medyo mataas ang concentration, okay siya. Pero minsan kasi, pag nakita mo yung result, nakalagay yung negative, di kaya minsan 0, 0.000 something, iisipin mo, ay wala palang leg dito, ay wala palang cadmium dito, wala palang mercury dito. Uh, pero mali yung ganong interpretation. Bakit? Kasi maaaring hindi lang kaya ng makina na basahin or i-analyze yung level ng metal doon sa na existing doon sa sample mo baka naman kailangan mo sang kailangan, kailangan mong gumamit ng isang makina na mas mababa yung detection limit for example in this case yung tinatawag na ICP MS so fortunately meron tayong ito sa DLSO so in case kailangan niyo uh, pwede nang ipadala yung mga samples niyo uh, later on pero karamihan kasi ng mga lab uh, free AS yung meron so kapag hindi niyo sa detect dito you can Do, uh, due diligence, for example, or if you have additional funds, pwede nyo siyang i-subject into ICPMS or Graphite Furnace AAS na mas mababa yung detection limit. So actually, it will also depend on your target. Eh. So mamaya may, may, may kita nyo dun sa dulo ng aking presentation yung mga references din natin uh, gamitin para malaman kung, or para i-direct tayo dun sa tamang uh, preparation methods. And in addition, is, uh, ipapakita ko rin naman yung DNR administrative orders kasi doon nakalagay kung ano ba yung mga ano uh, limits ng certain uh, ano natin, pollutants sa environment. So makita nyo, makita nyo yung moment. Uh, dito naman sa kabilang uh, uh, figure, makita natin dito yung difference nila. So nakikita natin, natin dito na yung AA at ICP destructive. So ibig sabihin nun, yung sample nyo, pag i-analyze mo sa AA sa ICP, huwag niyo expect na babalik sa inyo ng buo pa. Okay? Kasi kailangan iyo kailangan ba sa akin yung yung sample no? Sa madaling sabi, mamaya ipapakita natin kung paano ginagawa 'yon. Samantalang sa XRF yun nga kung pwede ipapelletize mo lang sa so mas madali na gamit, mas madali ay hindi niya sisirain yung sample mo. So, etc. may may mga iba pang detalye pero uh, hindi siguro natin i-cover muna para dito sa ating uh, usapan niya yung umaga. So general uh, sample preparation and analysis workflow. So again, this is general. Uh, you will be, you will need to check 
the specific ano no specific ng mga methods sa mga journals or sa mga standard methods para malaman kung ano ba talaga yung nilalagay pero then para may overview or para meron kayong idea kung paano siya ginagawa ganito yung nangyayari so una syempre gaga mag ka muna ng sample so it's dif- it's really different depending on the matrix or dun sa sample na gusto niyo kuhanin halimbawa for the, for lupa for for soil um baka kailangan yung magdig ng certain number of meters para makuha yung Uh, para maging maayos ang sampling nyo. O baka mamaya kailangan yung mag-sampling na medyo marami-rami para maging uh, mas okay yung resulta makuha nyo or mas accurate. And then, uh, mas representative pala. And then, we have also drinking water which is quite uh, easy kasi malinis siya. So, in general, kapag mas malinis yung sample mo, mas madali siyang i-analyze no, sa, sa elemental analysis. And then, kapag... Uh, environmental water naman, influence-based water, medyo tricky siya. So, you need for digestion later on. Meron din tayong air quality. So, sa air quality, nataka siguro kayo kung ano ginaga- paano ina-analyze no? yung, yung mga heavy metals or yung mga metals sa air. So, gumagamit po actually ng filter. Uh, tapos yung filter na yon iiwanan mo lang siya and then uh, after, uh, after a certain period of time, kukunin mo siya and then mag a ka rin ng acid. Tapos, pwede ka rin mag-analyze ng biological samples like fish, plants. Tapos, halos same lang din yung proseso. So, yung next step naman, pagkatapos may acquire yung sample mo, would be uh, dry ashing for soil or for ano, for, for other samples like, let's say, fish. Pwede ka rin mag-perform ng wet digestion. Tapos, ang pinaka, yun nga lang, ang pinaka uh, uso ngayon, kung, kung may budget yung lab, or yung pinakamadaling gawin would be microwave digestion. So, may kamahalan nga lang ito, nasa dalawang million pa taas yung presyo. Pero, uh, this will ensure that, ano, wala mag escape na samples. Kasi ang problem ng Itong nasa diagram natin, ito yung tinatawag na, ito yung example ng wet digestion. No? So, naka-escape kasi yung fumes, no? naka-escape yung ibang components ng no, analysis mo. And yung sample mo, kapag uh, pinapakuloan mo sa na may acid, like nitric, sulfuric, or hydrochloric. So, may, pwede kang magkaroon ng uh, loss ng, ano, uh, magkaroon ng uh, accuracy issues or recovery issues kapag gumamit ka ng wet acid. Especially kapag nasa PPB or parts per billion, parts per trillion level yung Uh, gusto mong targetin na analysis so medyo magkakaproblema ka. Pag PPM, most likely wala naman. Okay? So after yung digestion natin, if you filter, hindi ko na nalagay, no, hindi ko na nalagay dito, if you filter natin siya, and then after you filter sample, uh, i-dilute natin kasi kailangan natin pakabain. No? Just to be sure para hindi ma-oversaturate yung, uh, yung detector ng sample ng uh, instrument. And then later on, uh, as needed, no? May, may tinatawag tayo matrix modifiers in terms of standard source of present. So, you won't be covering the, uh, the details of these, pero may ina-add minsan ng mga reagents para ma-improve yung accuracy ng uh, analysis natin. And then later on, uh, yun, perform na tayo ng instrumental analysis. For AAS and ICP, kung magtatanong niyo kung gano'ng katagal yung analysis, mabilis lang siya. Siguro per sample, baka matagal na yung 5 minutes for graphite furnace yun. Pero pag AAS, Per trial, siguro wala pang 30 seconds. Eh. Mabilis lang talaga siya. So, ang tataka kayo kung bakit matagal mag-release ng results yung mga lab, uh, depende na yun sa pila ng mga sample sa kanila. Kasi syempre, hindi rin ganun kadali yung sample preparation eh, kung ibibigay nyo sa kanila na raw yung sample. So, yun yung mga kailangan yung isaalang-alang ng mga uh, factors when you're going to um, yung target nyo mag-perform ng elemental analysis. So, next naman yung uh, molecular spectroscopy in environmental research. So, I'll be focusing on uh, three main uh, instruments. So, pag may logo pala ng NASA, meron tayo sa lab nito. So, if, if you're interested, you can send samples to us. Um, ayun, meron tayong UV-Vis, FTIR, and then yung fluorescence spectrophotometer. So, yung UV-Vis sa yung fluorescence, very similar sila. May kita nyo mamaya. Uh, pero may very important na kaibahan. May kita nyo rin later dun sa next slide. And then, FTIR, uh, iba rin yung kanyang niche, no? iba rin yung kanyang paggagamitan. So, for molecular spectroscopy, ito yung EVVs uh, flowchart natin. Tayong deuterium tungsten lamp, meron tayong wavelength selector. Bakit kailangan mo piliin yung wavelength? Kasi um, yung mga samples natin, yung mga anerates natin, very specific sila sa mga wavelength na absorb. Ang problema kasi dito sa um, UVBs, uh, ang tawag sa kanya, anyway, continuous light source. No? So, pag sinabing continuous, very, ano siya, very wide yung range ng wavelength na nilalabas na halimbawa for deuterium lamp nasa 190 to 400 siya ginagamit for this yung tungsten lamp 400 to 900 nanometers. Kailangan mo kailangan mong salain yun, kailangan mo filter. 
So, doon papasok yung monochromatol natin. And then, we have the sample compartment. Familiar kayo most likely dito yung, yung, yung cubit natin and yung detector. So, madalas PMT na yung ginagamit. Pero pag medyo um, budget mill yung, ano, budget mill yung UVBs, silicon photo talagad pa yung ginagamit. So, mas mababa yung kanyang sensitivity. Next naman would be uh, yung konsepto ng chromocore. So, kung gusto nyo mag-analyze sa UVBs, kailangan na merong chromophore yung analyte nyo. Ibig sabihin nun, um, kailangan may portion yung molecule ng sample nyo na nag-absorbable uh, radiation. So, ang pinaka, ano, mabilis na palatandaan would be yung tinatawag na conjugated double bonds. Yung double, single, double. So, pag may ganyan sa structure, most likely kaya. And then, another thing, um, hindi naman sa exclusive no, sa organic compounds na may conjugated double bonds. Uh, sometimes, metals can also be analyzed in UVBs. Uh, kung baga pag wala kayong access sa AAS, you can opt to use the UVBs for metal analysis. Yung nga lang, hindi ganun ka baba yung concentration na kaya niyong basahin. Pero paano nangyayari yun kung wala namang double bond kasi di ba ang metal ay inorganic? So pwede kang mag-add na reagents na organic. Tapos i- ano, um, tawag dito, yung organic components nung ano, yung tawag dito nung reagent na i-add mo, yun yung mag-absorb para ma-quantify mo yung metals or yung, yung, yung elements mo. So, isa pang konsepto na kailangan natin, ano, uh, we consider yung tinatawag na lambda max or wavelength of maximum absorption. So, dito, uh, may kita natin yung mga functional groups sa organic chemistry. So, ito yung, meron sila mga specific na lambda max na no? Ta- talagang may kita natin ma-observe yun kapag nakita kami ng UV base or UV spectrum. So, saan ginagamit yung UV? Uh, it can be used for both quality and quantity analysis. By the way, yung mga teknik kanina na pinakita ko, yung AAS, for example, can only be used for quantitative analysis. Ibig sabihin nun, kapag hindi mo alam yung identity ng sample or identity yung existing na, let's say, metals doon, you will not be able to identify them kung wala kang standards na gagamitin doon sa AAS. Dito naman sa UV, um, pag meron kang reference standard, pwede mong i-compare yung, itong kinatawag na absorbance spectrum, pwede mong i-compare yung spectrum ng sample mo kung mag-match sila, kung magkapareho, then uh, it can be a candidate or it can be said na pareho yung identity niya. So, isa sa mga halimbawa yun. Marami, sobrang daming application ng UVBs. Kaya hindi ko rin ma-specify yung sample prep dito. Kasi hindi sa kagaya ng mga metals na, ano, ng AES na parang halos pare-pareho yung prep. So, dito medyo marami-raming reagents na ginagamit, marami-raming preparation na ginagawa depende sa analysis. No? So, napakalawak ng ano ng range ng mga preparation steps kaya hindi ko na nabanggit dito. So very general na lang itong mga ano natin, uh, discussion. So pwede ka rin mag-perform ng quantitation. So ibig sabihin nun, malalaman mo yung concentration ng analyte mo dun sa sample by using the, applying the lambda max, yung wavelength of maximum absorption. So in this case, it's around um, 550 siguro to. So may kita natin dito, um, habang tumataas yung concentration, gaya sa legend, Uh, tumataas din yung absorbance. So, ito yung, ano, ito yung uh, konsepto ng Beer's Law. The higher the uh, absorbance, the higher din na concentration. So, gamit yung law na yun, yung konsepto ng law na yun, kaya natin malaman yung concentration ng mga sample doon sa, anong analyte doon sa ating samples. Next naman yung um, mga ginagamit. So, ito yung nilalagyan ng sample. So, kailangan kung solid ba yung sample mo, kailangan mo siya i-convert into liquid form sa UVBs before you can perform UVBs. So, ito yung cubit, gawa siya sa quartz. Ang isa sa mga importanteng kailangan malaman natin dun sa uh, lalagyan ng sample, which is this one, ay dapat, uh, it must be, uh, tawag dito, it must be um, up for the uh, spectral region of interest. For example, yung quartz, okay siya gamitin na material, may kamahalan, pero okay siya gamitin kahit UV or visible region ka. Kasi um, hindi niya inaabsorb yung wavelengths na yun. So okay yung quartz. Pero halimbawa, well, medyo low budget, uh, plastic lang yung meron no? dun sa lab natin. Plastic na cubit na container. So hindi mo siya pwedeng gamitin sa UV region kasi nag-absorb siya ng UV light. So take note na pag mag-research kayo, take note nyo yung ganong consideration. Uh, non-negotiable siya. Ayan. So, ito yung uh, sa gitna, ito yung tinatawag na Zermitter near monochromator. Sa mga modern UVBs, ito yung nasa loob niya. So, ito yung uh, part ng instrument na ginagamit para maging, uh, para mag-filter out yung light. Kung may kita nyo dito, 
uh, buo yung light pa natin and then i-defract siya ng grating. Tapos uh, later on, may kita natin na pagdating dun sa detector, yung isang wavelength na lang or very specific na lang or shorter na yung uh, band ng wavelength na nakakalabas. Tapos yung medyo mga, actually may mga simple rin mga ano, may, mas may mga simple mga UVBs or makina na pwedeng gamitin. So instead na medyo nito, normal kung mga ka, may moving mirror ka, filters yung ginagamit. So mga water analysis kapag mga water analysis kits. So most likely ganito yung setup kasi limited lang naman yung ano yung mga parameters na gusto mong i-analyze kaya kayang kaya ng mga filters lang. So bawat filter represents a wavelength. So bawat wavelength may ano may katapat ka na uh, analyte. For example, phosphate, nitrate, etc. So uh kapart din ng mga reagents na yan doon sa sample yun yung konsepto uh, ng analysis. And then, we also need to discuss siguro ano, yung mga issues na pwedeng kaharapin kapag nag magamit ka ng UVBs. So, real deviations arise from changes on the refractive index on the analytical system. So, actually, medyo komplikado sa kung babasahin natin, pero gusto natin sabihin dito, um, i-double check natin no, yung spectrum ng ating mga, ano, ng ating mga sample. Kasi minsan, may, meron kang sabi ng journal mo, or sabi ng standard method mo, dapat ano, 390 nanometers sa limbawa yung wavelength na i-input natin doon sa software. Importante kasi yun, yung lambda max uh, na i-specify mo. No? So minsan kapag may nangyari mga changes sa sample, umuusod yan. And pag umusod yung lambda max mo, uh, pwede kang magkaroon ng issues doon sa quantitation. So take note natin yan. Kasi nagbabago yung refractive index ng no? um, Sample mo, manelit mo. Next naman, uh, chemical deviation. So, ang min, minsan meron tayong mga ano, may mga samples tayo na mabilis magbago yung form, no? Kapag na-expose sa temperature, mas tumaba yung temperature, tumaas yung temperature, o nagkaroon ka ng, ano, nagkaroon ka ng iba pang environmental pressures. So, it can, ano, can have shifts, no? Dun sa kanyang equilibrium. Kapag nangyari yun, pwede rin maapektuhan yung analysis mo. So the bottom line here is that you need to make sure that your samples are stable kapag pinadala mo doon sa lab. Halimbawa, kung ikaw nag-prepare ng sapat, ganito yung temperature niya habang uh, nagka-travel or habang pinapadala mo doon sa lab. Kasi ngayon, di ba, since pandemic, kung talagang gusto natin magpa-analyze, hindi natin pwedeng dalhin on our own. Most likely, magre-require na yung mga labs na ipakourier mo sa. So kung papadaanin mo, especially yung galing ka sa malayong lugar, it would be best to indicate yung mga ano uh, ganitong mga um, issues with regards to your sample or ganitong mga sensitivities. So another issue would be, ito medyo very common to, no, na hindi natin napapansin, na kapag nag-prepare tayo, ay, na-dilute ko na. Na ano, dissolve ko na yung sample ko, okay na to, salang ko na sa UV. So importante malaman natin na pag may mga particulates, suspended particles, colloidal particles yung ating mga sample, we have to uh, ensure that these are minimized or eliminated at best. Uh, minimized at best, no? Or eliminated kung kaya. Kasi, uh, ang konseptong ginagamit naman na natin dito yung Lombards, no? Na sinasabi na yung path length, yung dinadaanan ng light. So, sa case ng cubit, it's one centimeter typical, you know? Yung size, yung, yung length ng cubit. Uh, kung ano siya, directly proportional sa absorbance ng light. So, pag ganun yung case, uh, at may mga uh, particles, masisira yung path ng light mo, hindi na diretso. So, kung anong mabasa mong reading doon sa instrument, hindi na siya tama. Kasi na-deflect yung light na dapat patagos lang doon sa sample. Okay. So, isa pa, uh, ito medyo common sa mga teaching labs and yung mga universities. No? Siyempre talagang ang UVBs, since it's a very simple instrument to ano, navigate and to use. Um, yung cubit, gamit na gamit. So, madalas talaga may mga scratches. Ngayon, ang tanong, ano ba ang epekto ng scratches natin? So, uh, pag nagkaroon ka ng scratches doon sa qubit, uh, maapektuhan din yung light signal mo gaya nung kung paano naapektuhan yung light signal doon sa uh, scattering natin kanina. So, take care of your uh, qubit. So, yun nga, site imperfections, scattering losses will affect your analysis in UVBs. So, the next uh, technique I will be discussing is fluorescence spectrophotometer. No? So, for this one, um, it's quite similar to the setup of the UVBs, but instead of just having a wave, uh, one wavelength selector, we have two na. So, dalawa na wavelength selector natin kasi 
for uh, fluorescent samples, pag sinabi kasi yung fluorescence, pag may sinat- kung kanina chromophore yung target natin, kapag merong fluorophore naman yung sample mo, after niya mag-absorb ng light, nag-i-emit din siya later on. So yung emitted light, yun yung bin-detect ng makina. Kaya kailangan mo rin salain yung emitted light ng sample mo. So yun yung konsepto ng fluorescence. So basically, dalawa yung wavelength selectors niya. One for the excitation and one for the emission of light. So why is, it's not that common actually. Um, kumbaga talagang very common pa rin yung UVBs natin. Pero may mga samples kasi na we, we want to, ano eh, we want to tap into this, ano, into this, um, thousand characteristic of the analyte na nag-fluoresce siya. Bakit? Kasi, you can analyze lower concentrations. It makes your, it, it, uh, it, most of the time, it makes your analysis more sensitive kapag, ano, uh, kapag fluorescent siya. So, kaya mo siyang i-analyze ng lower than uh, percent levels, no? usually kapag uh, fluorescent spectrophotometer is yung gamit. Yun ay kapag fluorescent yung sample. Sa so, minsan, nag-add ng dye, ganyan. Minsan, naturally fluoresc- uh, fluorescent yung sample. So, it really depends on the sample. So, may mga loss. I, I don't think we need to go uh, deeper into this. Pero ito yung, uh, kumbaga, ang gusto ko lang makipakita dito na it's another concept, no? Then the beer Lambert's to na ina-apply doon sa UVBs kanina tsaka sa EAS. Next one would be yung FTIR natin. So, yung UVBs kanina, ginagamit siya primarily for, ano no, quantity analysis, quantitative, kung gusto malaman yung concentration ng sample, nung anong sample mo. Kapag naman mas target mo malaman yung identity niya at organic yung nature ng sample mo, then we have the FTIR for that. So yung FTIR natin, or for transfer infrared spectrometer, it's, um, it looks like um, yung earlier photo kanina, pero ito yung nasa loob niya. So meron kang, or, wait na, So, this has to be corrected. Hindi siya xenon arc lamp. It's uh, usually a heat source. Pag infrared light kasi heat source yung ginagamit natin. Usually in ceramic form in most cases. We also have the wavelength selector para papakita natin sa next slide later na hindi siya katulad ng filter na fi- fi- uh, parang filter activity ng monochromator. And then we have a lot of uh, sample compartments or sample sampling devices depending on your sample. And then we also have uh, a detector na hindi sa photo detector kasi hindi na UV or visible light yung pinag-uusapan dito, infrared light na. So it has to detect infrared radiation na yung detector natin. So pinakomon uh, ngayon yung tinatawang na pyroelectric detector. So ito yung itsura ng FTIR nyo. Medyo kakaiba sa hindi sa yung ano yung kagaya yung sa monochromator kanina na ang function ay mag-filter no, ng, ng, ng signal, ng wavelength. So dito, ang tawag dito ay Metheson Interferometer. So it allows ano, um, simultaneous, no, or hindi, pa, hindi simultaneous, eh, more of ano, very quick na passing ng uh, wavelengths or ng radiation doon sa sample mo based on its action. So yung interferogram na mapoproduce is converted into the IR spectra. So yung IR spectra natin, it looks like this. So, medyo similar dito pero nakabaliktad na kung transmission yung nasaan natin, uh, y-axis. Pero this is your IR spectra. Yung absorbance usually ay yung, yung interferogram um, kinoconvert sa into a transmission or absorbance uh, signal using the Fourier transform. So yung FT dun sa FTIR, it's not part of the instrument. It, it's actually a uh, mathematical uh, formula to convert the interferogram signal into a, an absorbance or transmission signal. So sampling technique. So magandang FTIR kasi ang dami mong pwedeng i-analyze or ang daming klaseng sample na pwede mong i-analyze sa kanya. So yun nga lang, it's really dependent or it's really um, relative to the uh, sampling, uh, no, sampling techniques or sampling devices that you have. So meron tayong liquid cell, meron tayong attenuated total reflectance or ATR. Ito yung meron sa lab natin dito sa uh, Lasal, uh, sa Laguna Campus. We have the KBR pellet. So you may be familiar with the, ano, no, with the uh, KBR pellet. So this is used for powder analysis. Transmission yung, it's under the category of transmission. So in general, kapag transmission yung technique, you will be getting better results. So kung medyo mababa yung concentration ng sample mo, whether it be in powder form or in liquid form, best it is best to use transmission techniques like yung KDR pellet and yung liquid cell. Pero 
if uh, you're not worried about the signal naman, you can use reflectance techniques. The main advantage of reflectance techniques, like yung ATR natin dito sa screen, is that it's very easy to use. Dito kasi sa liquid cell, marami ka pang setup-setup na gagawin, isa sandwich mo yung liquid mo. Sa KBR pellet naman, kailangan mo pa siyang i-pressurize. Pagbasag yung pellet na nakadissolve sa KBR, uh, potassium bromide, um, uulitin mo yung preparation. So it's very tedious. As compared to the ATR na kung may liquid sample ka, ipapatak mo lang siya dun sa ano, gitna dun sa crystal dito sa screen and then kung meron kang powder lalagay mo lang sa dun sa crystal sa gitna so it's very easy to use and you'll also be getting uh, mission yun nga lang since uh, mas marami kang mirror sa loob dito na dadaanan ng signal mo maraming nalulose din na, si- na, na data along the way and then hindi ganun ka detailed yung spectra as compared to transmission so it really depends on your objective Uh, we have other techniques, so actually we can also analyze gases no? in, in FTIR, so these are also available. Kung gusto mo lang ma-analyze yung parang uh, surface ng sample mo, yung very thin film dun sa surface ng sample, you can use the uh, specular reflectance. Pag may powder sample ka and you want better results than ATR, then you can use diffuse reflectance naman. So it's re- there's really a lot, so hindi lahat, hindi lahat nandito sa slides, no? There's really a lot of techniques that you can use. Even dun sa mga binanggit ko kanina ng mga tech, uh, makina, you can uh, research no, on uh, the developments of the sampling devices na meron tayo sa market ngayon. Kasi talagang ang bilis nito mag-evolve. Kasi gusto, na, gusto, ng mga, ano, gusto natin na paladiliin talaga yung analysis. Okay, so for FTIR, ano ba yung hinahanap? So I hope you are quite familiar kahit konti sa organic chemistry and yung konsepto ng functional groups. So these are uh, parts of the molecule, no? So sa FTIR, these functional groups produce a distinct ano, no, uh, absorption band. So for example, if your molecule contains um, this uh, triple bond between carbon and nitrogen or perhaps an OH, may meron may makita ka na signal dun sa around 3200 tapos ganito yung shape niya so you can use this as a guide pero um if you're not deep into researching yung ano yung uh, talagang structure ng sample mo and you will just like to confirm its identity then most uh, cases in most cases pwede mong gamitin yung tinatawag na library searching Uh, function ng FTIR mo. So, hindi lahat ng library is kompleto, no? So, uh, minsan kailangan mong bumili ng library para talagang makita mo yung sample mo. Minsan kasi wala dun sa uh, inherent na library ng makina. Pero, very easy to use ito kasi pagka-analyze mo ng sample, you don't need to be able to memorize, no? Itong mga stretches na to, itong mga absorption bands na to. At, uh, madali mo silang mahanap dito kung exist yun nga lang, this will only work for pure samples eh, in most cases. Kasi pag mixture yung sample mo or bagong product sa, it will be very difficult to ano to identify the exact uh, identity no, ng, ng sample. So, may mga ano tayo dito, may mga case-to-case basis tayo ng mga discussions on this. Pero suffice to say na eh, may ganun sang function and uh, kaya siya very, ano, very common sa mga labs. Kung may kita nyo dito, sa screen natin, may kita nyo mga crime lab, crime lab, no? Kasi very useful ang ano, very useful ang FTIR sa mga crime lab, sa mga forensic uh, activities. So, imamatch lang nila yung sample na nakuha nila sa crime scene. Uh, pwede na lang ma-identify yung uh, compound meron. So, syempre, environmental research yung ating analysis, no? Pero, um, so, This will give you an idea kung ano ba yung mga pwede natin gawin. Actually, uh, the main problem with FTIR is not, anyway, it's really, ano, parang more of, ano siya, supporting siya dun sa ibang makina ng confirm- confirmatory ng identity ng compound. Kung makikita natin dito sa screen, it's always coupled most of the time with other techniques. So you can um, use this guide or you can check out uh, Visser, Visser's uh, publication na ng um, 2000. Yung title niya, very specific na IR analysis, uh, IR spectroscopy for environmental analysis. So, you can you can uh, check out this uh, list and other uh, details also as well in the publication. Yun. So, there's a lot of uh, things that you can analyze or if you want to investigate these things in, uh, in conjunction with other techniques as well. 
So the next topic would be uh, actually last na to. So very quick lang na yung ating discussion. So, so we'll have more time to uh, answer questions later. So we have some resources. So kung medyo blanco ka on, on where to start, so you can check out these uh, websites. So you can check the US Environmental Protection Agency. They have a collection of methods for each matrix that you may want to environmental matrix that you may want to um, analyze para at least alam mo yung i-prepare mo, bibilhin mo, ganyan, or ano yung mga technique na gagamitin. You also have um, the AFA-AWA or American Public Association, American Water Works Association standard method. So, very popular to for the ano, analysis of drinking water and both drinking water and wastewater. And then we also have um, other references like yung ASTM, AOAC for uh, other samples like soil, ganyan. And then, yung SMU, ayan. So, standard methods for the examination of water and wastewater. So, although, um, we have those things, though, for the for the guidance, pero it will also be very important if we're going to be very specific to the Philippine context, we need to check the DNR administrative orders. Uh, for example, for, for, ano, for chemists, especially, and then yung mga yan, nasa lab, or kung pang-regulatory yung function natin, or gusto natin maka-contribute sa policy, for example, we have to um, check this out, itong DAO uh, 2016-012, kasi andito yung mga technique na inaalaw ng DNR. So for example, if you want to analyze uh, these metals, like cadmium, iron, lead, then ang iaalaw ng DNR, kung, kung gagamitin mo sa regulatory purposes, ha, ay yung play method lang. I and then actually lahat ng binanggit ko kanina ng mga ano ng mga common techniques tapos yung mga methods yung mga step by step procedures nakalista rin dito so again you can just check uh, them out yung US EPA most likely libre pero itong mga SMU AOAC AFAAWA kailangan mong bilhin so yun nga lang yung caveat doon na kailangan mo silang kailangan budget for for acquiring these standards and then, what else? And actually, so that was the last slide pala. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, I'm ready now to answer your questions. Okay, thank you so much for listening. All right. Okay, so magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Um, maraming salamat for the talk, uh, Sir Chris. So before um po tayo pumunta sa question and answer so by the way magpapakilala muna po ako um, um i am jeffrey bunkin ako po ang founder ng filipino science hub so i'm calling in from uh, houston texas so medyo gabi na po dito ng um uh, biyernes so okay so before po tayo mag proceed sa ating q a medyo may ilang patalasas lang muna po tayo okay so um eto um can you see my screen nakikita niyo na po ba Okay, I would assume that that, that you're, you're seeing it. Okay, so so by the way po, we just crossed 35,000 um, followers po sa Facebook. So ang atin pong komunidad ng mga Pilipinong guro at estudyante uh, who were highly activated to learn more uh, about, you know, like different STEM areas. So lumalaki pa po. So, you know, um, um, please do us the favor po of, you know, spreading the word around because, you know, what we do here at Filipino Science Hub is essentially to bring you um, inspirational figures just like um, uh, Mr. Chris Argamino and also, you know, like share quite a bit of uh, their exp of uh, their expertise uh, through this platform. So hopefully po marami pang mga estudyante at mga guru ang ating maabot. Um, anyways. Okay, so. Punong-puno po ang, ang buwan ng September at October um, sa Filipino Science Hub when it comes to web events. So today po, we just had the lecture of Mr. Chris Argamino on atomic and molecular uh, spectroscopy for environmental research. So at the end of this month din po, so on September 30th, uh, we are going to be graced by Professor Alphonse Jason Pelgone. So he's from Philippine Normal University and he'll talk about STEM teaching assessment strategy. So paano ba effectively makakapag-evaluate uh, or assess ng uh, pagkaturo ng STEM, you know, most especially during the new normal mode of teaching. So uh, the talk of Professor Pelgone is actually part of a tripartite collaboration involving Philippine Normal University, Filipino Science Hub, as well as 
and I think like yeah, primarily by the Foundation for the Upgrading of the Standard of Education or FUSE. So it's the Education Foundation under the Lusitan Group of Companies. So ito po ay series ng STEM teacher training program where we uh, deliver training courses on pedagogy and as well as uh, practical and innovative STEM teaching, uh, teaching strategies uh, devised by Filipino scientists from different parts of the world. So majority of which are, are part of uh, the Filipino Science Hub. So check that webinar series out po. Um, okay, and then, so as Karen had mentioned earlier, so um, Filipino Science Hub and De La Salle University's Center for, um, Inst uh, Center for Inst Instrumentation and, and Facil Central Instrumentation Facility um uh is bringing uh is delivering to you what uh, we call like the modern analytical methods webinar series so where we are going to be delivering uh webinars on five uh modern analytical um techniques um so so sir chris argamino for september um october 9th um uh, mr uh, dr jose esmira will talk about fundamentals of scanning electron microscopy um, November naman po, um, we'll have Dr. Virgilio Ebajo, um, Jr. He'll talk about nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy for natural products application. So, um, and then December po, we'll have Mr. Michael Hernante. He'll talk about a multi-species cytogenic uh, analysis. And then this webinar series will be capped by a very good friend of ours, um, Dr. Anna Karen Lacerna. So she'll talk about liquid chromatography instrumentation and applications in natural products research. So abangan niyo po yung mga mahalagang dates na yan. So hanggang January hanggang 2022 na po ito. And all of these webinars are, are being brought to you by Phil Sai Hub and De La Salle University for free. So um and po sabi nga namin kung meron po kayong mga kakilala who would benefit from these types of webinars or like from these topics, please you know like um um, have them visit our official Facebook page and also our official website at www.falsahub.com kasi nandun po lahat yung information on how you can register um, for these events. Okay, so, um, and then, um, sa so buwan naman po na October, so as I have mentioned, Dr. Esmeria, October 9th, um, on October 16th, we will be graced by um, uh, an American scientist who's working for PPG, which is, oh, uh, I think, uh, one of the biggest, if not the, big, the biggest, paint, paint and coatings companies in the world. So, uh, Dr. Ted Novitsky is uh, an expert in this area, and he'll talk about um, paints and coatings. So, his, uh, the name of his, uh, the title of his talk is uh, the science and of protecting and beautifying the world with paints and coatings. So. Napaka rare po na mga gantong klase ng opportunities where we are, uh, you know, able to uh, bring closer to the Filipino um, STEM community yung mga foreign expert po um, when it comes to medyo mas industrial or application type ng, um, ng, ng research and development. And then on October 23rd, we'll, we will be joined by Dr. Neil uh, Ergar, Ergar Green from um, the Institute of Mathematical and Sci uh, Sciences and Physics from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. And he'll talk about maths in action. So controlling sound and electromagnetic waves. So medyo, um, medyo may fundamentals po ito ng math and then at the same time, meron ding application um, side. And then, last but not the least, on October 30th, uh, we will be graced by uh, uh, the, uh, the duo of um, Dr. Analet Carrasco of PhilSci Hub based here in Houston, Texas, and also by Mr. J.P. Onya, who is uh, the Vice President of PhilSci Hub and the Head of PhilSci Hub, Re PhilSci Hub Research University. So they will give uh, teachers and students a crash course on the fundamentals of research. So it's po applicable to elementary at the end at uh, at all levels, elementary, high school, and college level. So please check all of these uh, web, uh, webinars out. So yung events po natin ng November and December, i-announce pa po natin. So sabi nga, gaya nga po na pinapangako namin lagi, we will try to keep you as STEM busy as possible, you know, um, sa lahat po ng inyong mga Sabado ngayong taon at maging hanggang sa susunod na taon po. All right. Okay, and then uh, one very uh, um, important reminder rin po. So, um, meron po tayo mga PhilSci Hub interns and individual contributors who have been creating uh, STEM 
uh, short lecture video. So, engaging lecture videos. And so, nag-release po tayo on a daily basis ng mga gantong contents. So, every Monday po is Bio Monday. So, ito po ay mga... Uh, Pagbabahagi when it comes to different areas, uh, different lessons in biology, and uh, these are delivered by our individual contributors from Pamantasan ng Lungsod ng Maynila. So we have Kyla Corsega, Desiree Montehermoso, Gerald Gayona, and Angelica Pagaran. Um, every Tuesdays po, um, we get to release um, chemistry uh, related videos, so chemistry tidbits by Jason Olcano. Every Wednesday is a bio is bio is biochemistry day. So biochem for dummies by Bella Fami from UP Manila. Um, every Thursday is uh, all about biotechnology. So biotech and chill um, by Joshua Ison, and then um, BioTuro. So this is actually uh, focusing on strategies on how to tech to teach biology most effectively. Um, we have Michael Lupak um, leading that one. So check uh, our official Facebook page po. Um, dun po namin release yung mga a 10 to 20 minute uh, uh, short video lecture videos on, on certain topics. So, kung meron po kayong mga estudyante na kailangan ng supplemental materials, these are actually going to be very helpful. All right. Sir Chris, handa na ba? Nakainom ka na ba ng tubig? Hello po, yes sir. Ayun. Hi, so, ayan. Okay. okay, so ano, time for for uh, the the Q&A. Okay. So this is a question from YouTube, and I think let's start with this one. So this is touching on you know like more fundamental um aspects. So okay, question sir is, I mean, is you, uh, from Ryan Nove um Huang from YouTube. So is UV this for colored solutions only? UV this for color. Okay. I thank you for the question, Mister Ryan. So um actually, po, uh, it may be common misconception that na pang colored lang sa. Pero hindi po siya limited to, ano, to a colored solution. So, in fact, yung ultraviolet nga hindi na pinakita, di ba? Ultraviolet light. So, you can actually ano, also analyze colorless solutions in uh, EVVs. Pinga, um, pinaka-importante talaga would be the criteria na meron siyang conjugated double bonds na will act as, ano, uh, which will absorb yung ano natin, UV or visible radiation. Alright. Okay, maraming salamat po, uh, Sir Chris. Okay, next question is from Maria Elenita De Castro. Sa Zoom naman po ito. Um, her question, uh, ito po. So, which among AAS, ICP AES, and XRF will provide the most accurate assessment of the trace slash heavy metal content in plant and soil samples? Thank you for the question, Ms. Uh, De Castro. So, siguro po, uh, I would eliminate XRF dito sa ganitong usapan kasi talagang si XRF mas pang high concentration siya, like high ppm or percent level. So if we're going to choose between, actually in terms of, ano naman, in terms of accuracy, okay naman pareho yung AAS and ICP. And um, the problem would be siguro, ano, gano'n ba kababa yung, ano, yung, yung concentration ng gusto natin targetin? Kasi um, kung makita natin yung, ano, uh, for example, yung DNR daw uh, 2016-08, and that contains the, ano, no, the eh, sorry, ano pala to sa example. So it may be another, ano, it may be another, um, tawag dito standard na containing the parameters, no, yung mga limits. Pero it will be very important din to know kung ano ba yung target natin na, ano, na concentration. Kasi again, gaya nung nabanggit ko kanina, kung PPM level, it would be best to use the AAS kung konti lang yung metals mo. If you want a more efficient analysis, then it, it will be best to use ICPAS kasi sabay-sabay eh. Halimbawa nila more than five elements yung gusto mong madaman, yung concentration. Now, uh, if you're going for PPD parts per billion level na, na analysis, then you'll need to, uh, ano na, to go to AAS graphite analysis na, graphite furnace, and then for ICP, ICPMS na. Kung PPT, lalo ICPMS. So, medyo wala kang choice dun kung di gumamit ng ICPMS. Ayun po. All right. Okay, maraming salamat po. Next question. Um, this one is from... Okay, did I skip? Okay, from Ar Arlene Mia Rugian. So from Zoom. So since the instruments vary in their detection limits, how would you know which technique must be used if you have no rough estimate of the concentration of the elements you're testing? Hmm. Okay. 
So, siguro ano, to answer this question, rough estimate, uh, for, 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 for me siguro, ano, uh, yung pinaka-available sa'yo na kaya ng budget mo, you, you go for that technique. Kasi talagang ano eh, I mean, sa Pilipinas kasi, talagang ano, uh, medyo may kamahalin yung analysis eh. So, um, minsan hindi na lang sa matter ng ano, matter ng accessibility din. Uh, matter sa accessibility and budget. So, kung ano yung technique na mas, mala- may, mas may access ka in terms of yung uh, proximity siguro, I guess, and ano and yung budget mo kung kaya, kung gagasusan mo man siya, then I think that would be the best, ano, the best instrument to use. Pag hindi, pag hindi mo siya na-detect doon, uh, then doon ka na magpo-proceed doon sa paghahanap ng iba pang technique to, ano, to, to um, address your concern. To know, to know the, ano, the rough end, to know the, ano, kasi, the, tawag ito, the, um, content. Tapos, in terms of rough estimate, uh, XRF kasi has the ability to scan eh. So if you have access to an XRF at siguro swerte ka na mataas ng concentration medyo, then you'll be getting a rough estimate. And then most ICP instruments also have the semi-quantitative mode. Yung semi-quantitative mode, it's, it gives you estimates on the concentrations of all elements na kaya nung uh, nababasa. So yun po siguro yung uh, pwedeng gamitin. Alright. Okay. So... Okay, I thought maybe mas question to about about the capabilities ng Lasal. I know that. From uh, Maria Elenita De Castro, does DLS you have microwave for sample preparation? And po, at the moment po unfortunately wala pa tayo at the CIF wala pa, pero we have uh an adjacent lab yung water research laboratory natin sa DLSU. I'm not sure yet if they're open to receiving samples from outside, pero they have a microwave uh digester. Okay, all right. Next question. And actually, by the way, baka po meron tayong um, audience yeah, members na gustong magtanong ng question live. So, uh, we encourage you to to, ra- to raise your virtual hand. So, it's a feature naman sa Zoom. Um, and kapag meron po sa inyo gustong magtanong ng question live, may patapa, I will acknowledge you and will let you unmute your mic. So, ayun po. Okay. Um, okay, next question naman, sir. Um, I want to make sure I didn't skip through any of them. Okay, this one is from Eileen Beroya. Sir Chris, how sure are we that the water in the different refilling stations are safe for human consumption? Okay, so, thank you for the question, Ms. Beroya. Yung, siguro yung, paano ba sagutin ito? Yung safety kasi very relative siya. Pero kung ang pagbabasehan natin ay regulatory standards, then we'll have to look at the ano, EOH guidelines no, for drinking water. And yun yung sinusunod ng ating mga ano, mga uh, refilling stations kasi nagpapatest um, periodically. I believe parang every three months or every six months depending on the parameter. So to answer the question, how sure are we? Then you'll have to um, check the ano the tawag dito the uh, lab test results ng mga testing ano nyo, ng mga refilling stations nyo kung nagpapatest ba sila. So yung pinaka common zan would be uh, they have this uh, I think not sure kung ano yung specific na ano ba na na microorganism pero merong mi- micro test and then meron ding heavy metal test so you'll have to ask them for the results if you want to uh, be sure na safe yung for consumption yung kanilang mga tubigs o bibenta Alright, okay. Maraming salamat po dun sa sagot na yun. Okay. So by the way, no, uh, Sir Sir Chris, we have, we, meron tayong um, I think more than 240 live participants today. So marami kang fans. Okay, so we have uh, yeah, somebody raised his hand. So Sir uh, Adeniko uh, Suryaga. So Sir, um, um, feel free to unmute your mic um, and ask your question. Uh, good morning po sa lahat. Good morning po. Sir Chris, I am Adiliko Suryaga from Arnu. And uh, I would like just to ask you, how many years would be the duration of cuvette for your UVs? Like, how many years for plastics and how many years for parts? Okay. So, thank you, sir. Good morning then sa inyo. Um, medyo mahirap po sagutin yung duration question kasi talagang it will depend on 
uh, the samples that you are analyzing, kung nagmamark ka ba sila, nagsistain ba, kung nalilinis mong mabuti yung qubit mo. Pero definitely, for quartz, it's um uh, it's reusable. Eh. So kung nalilinis mo sa nang maayos, tatagal naman sa At kung hindi mo sa nai-scratch, no? tatagal naman sa nang baka nga sampung taon. Pero depende rin sa frequency eh. So, depende kung gano'ng kadalas mo sa nagagamit. And then, for plastic, ayun, uh, ang plastic kasi disposable siya supposedly. So, yung ibang mga, ano, nasa teaching lab siguro, ay nagde- nagre-reuse kasi siyempre sayang, di ba? Kano rin yan? Limang piso yan. Nung time, nung time na bumili ako, limang piso isa eh. Nung disposable na plastic unit. So, hindi ko alam kung magkano na ngayon. Pero definitely, Um, ano sa hindi ko masabi sir kasi yun nga disposable siya so it ideally tinatapon din sa well hindi sa advisable for the environment pero yun nga ideally tinatapon din sa pag after use so depende na sa iyo kung kung ano kung i-reuse mo pa sa at kung gaano sa kalinis after uh, let's say ano pag nilinis mo ayan all right okay maraming salamat po para uh, maraming salamat po sa tanong sir Adinico meron pa po ba kayong ibang questions Ah, wala na siguro. Hi, uh, Sir Jeff, sorry. It's uh, it's me, Dindy Boyles. <laughs> ano, <laughs> <laughs> ano, additional comment lang dun sa pivot. I think kung yung blank, yung blank testing nyo is ano na, all over the place na, I think that's a good indication na it's time to give it up. <laughs> yeah. So yun lang, additional comment lang. Ayun. Okay. So, okay, next question naman, balik tayo dun sa ating Zoom question. So, this one is from, um, I don't know how, I'm hoping I won't butcher your name, uh, Z- Zyrus Ray Guzman. So, for baseline data gathering, is it ideal to use both AAA and ICP, especially, especially, <laughs> if you have no idea yet on the concentration of elements on samples? Baseline data gathering. Thank you so much for the question, Mr. Guzman. And... Yeah, it's actually sir, my former student. Eh. Ah, naku. <laughs> Salamat. Yeah, yeah. Ay, sorry, sorry. Sagutin natin ito naman sa'yo. So, uh, based on data gathering, so I'm guessing your perspective is from, ano, an EIA perspective, so environmental impact assessments. No? Um, is it ideal to use both AAS and ICP? I don't think so, na kailangan mong gamitin pareho. Kasi especially kung nakita natin kanina, kung naalala nyo kanina yung slide ko on the DNR DAO, presenting yung ano yung mga allowed na methods na DNR so you can actually use either AAS or ICP lang eh you don't have to use both so both are accepted naman uh, for 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 this purpose yes all right okay so so before that we proceed sa next questions uh, sir Chris um ito may question sa um, Zoom na ano para more on like general um information about the La Salle University's facility so it's a question mm-hmm. from Jeffrey Ken Balangao. So, uh, said, uh, hello po, Sir Chris. Does DLSU also have XRD and SEM EDS? Ayan. So, uh, XRD po, unfortunately, wala tayo. Uh, if, you're, if you really need to have your samples analyzed, I believe DOST has one. So, just recently, meron kaming student na nagpadala sa DOST. Eh. Admatel, I think. I'm not sure. Pero, I just have to check. Pero, yun po, unfortunately, D- DLSU doesn't have one. And then, Uh, for S- SEM EDS, we have that po. Uh, actually, next week, you, you can, ano, you can, you will be, tawag dito, happy to know na meron tayong, ano, webinar to be presented by our, ano, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Jose Esmeria Jr., who handles the, ano, the integrated electron microscopy lab. And specifically, yung focus na will be the SEM EDS. So, if you want, and, uh, sir, I think nandito si Dr. Jojo, eh. Pero, ano, I, uh, You can, uh, siguro in general, if you have inquiries, you can email us at cif at dnsu.edu.ph na lang. Ayan. Ayan. So, yan. Pukotact niyo po yung mga kaibigan natin sa DLSU CIF. Okay. Next question. This one is from Joan Casila sa Zoom. So, uh, ito po yung tinatanong niya. So, how much more? <laughs> Ay, ako, medyo, ano pala to? Uh, general, eh, FYI pa rin. Pero uh, I think you know it. I mean, let's say it. Um, how much pong FTIR analysis sa DLSU for water and sediment sample? Um, specifically, microplastics analysis. And um, siguro po, nagtatanong rin siya about turnaround time. So when it comes to these things po, for example, 30 water samples, 30 sediment samples. 
Okay, so how much yung FDA rin? Siguro, uh, po, siguro po, I'll, I'll have to start with ano, mentioning kung ano yung meron kami sa, ano, no, sa, sa CIF. We only have, ano, very specific po, eh, ATR lang ang meron kami. So if you're okay with that, then we can talk for the analysis. Tapos, how much? It depends po on, ano, we have, ano po kasi different, ano, different rates for different uh, groups. So for example, since we're a DLS UNTP, kapag tagalasal ka, talagang medyo mas malaki-laki yung discount. And then it increases kapag ano, kapag uh, nasa government car industry. So you can actually send us an email na lang if you want to know the rates kasi medyo ano po, komisado. And okay. right around time, I'll... Sige po. Ah, sige po. Yung turn around time, sigo, yung 30 water samples, mabilis lang naman po ang analysis ng FDIR. Actually, yung pinaka-problema natin dito yung pagpasok po namin kasi naka-ano naka, ano tayo, no? Naka-skeleton work, workforce pa rin. So, every, ano lang po kami, ideally, every three weeks na kapapasok. So, siguro po, masabi ko, one to three weeks depende dun sa, ano namin, sa schedule na maabutan po natin. Sa so, ganun po. Alright. Okay. Next question. Maraming salamat, sir. Uh, okay, this one is from Marlo Fabia from Zoom. So, in preparing the research capsule at the onset, how to know if a lab analysis techniques and or methodology is fit for use and effectively defined? In preparing, uh, ito po yung ano, very important. Uh, thank you for this question. Ang ganda po nito. Kasi talagang pag nag-prepare ng mga ano, proposal, uh, minsan talagang hindi nagbabangga yung, ano, yung nilalagay doon sa methods, doon sa availability. So I guess, uh, how do you know if the analysis is fit for use and effectively defined? Paano, paano ba? Um, uh, sir, can you also, ano, paano ba? Pwede po ba kayong magsalita? Para, kasi parang may gusto lang ako ano, clarify dito sa mga. Medyo, ano, pero medyo, ano po, medyo broad yung question. Baka po pwede yung kapag-analyze okay. natin. Um, andyan po ba si Sir Marlo Fabia? Medyo nahiya yata. Ay, ano po, sana po. Sige po, sige. Sagutin ko nilang din sa broadly, no? Kung nahiya si Sir. So, maganda po talaga na makapag-consult ano, tayo doon sa lab na plano natin pagpasahan ng sample. Or planong, oh, ganun. So, for example, kami po, sa practice namin dito sa CIF, um we don't ano we don't um accept readily yung sample analysis no we, we discuss with the clients we, we sometimes we also ano we also um schedule zoom meetings with them para talagang pag-usapan ano ba yung objectives mo so ano ba yung object uh, kasi dapat talaga nakabangga yung objective doon sa ano anyway, method tapos isa pa hindi kasi lahat na nakasulat doon sa mga papers sa mga journals ay available so hindi natin pwedeng i-assume yun. So you really have to check with the lab that you will be um, submitting your samples to to kung ano ba talaga yung capability nila at ano ba yung objectives para masiguro na talagang may, matatapos mo yung research mo or magagawa mo ng maayos yung analysis. Thank you. Alright. Okay. Next, okay. This one is from Jeffrey Balangao. So, is fly ash heavy metals more accurate to be analyzed in liquid or solid form? If in either solid or liquid, what is the most accurate and efficient technique to analyze these heavy metals? Is the technique cost efficient? So, medyo ang dami. Okay. Ang dami tanong na, sir. Sige po. Sige po. Uh, unang tanong muna siguro na, is fly ash heavy metals? Na siguro nasa ano to si sir? Nasa coal power plant? <laughs> na, 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 na industry? Nasa ganyan? Um, is fly ash heavy metals more accurate to be analyzed in liquid or solid form? Ah, uh, siguro masabi ko sir, ano, depende kasi doon sa ano eh, sa level ng heavy metal na gusto mong ano, na gusto mong malaman or yung target mong i-analyze, yung target mong makuha kasi again, um kapag ano ka kapag nasa let's say ano ka lang, percent level ng matataas na concentration, pwede ka mag-XRF. So solid yung ganun. I mean solid form ka. Kapag naman trace metals, usually kapag heavy metal trace eh, um kailangan mong i-digest yung sample mo para maging liquid form. Kasi hindi sila ma-analyze ng mga makina kung hindi sila naka-liquid form. So siguro yun po yung sagot dun sa unang tanong. Pangalawa, if in either solid or liquid, what is the most accurate and efficient technique to analyze these heavy metals? Okay, so accurate. 
So, wala naman po sigurong ano, uh, tawag dito. Uh, siguro, pa, pa, in terms of accuracy and efficiency, I guess, uh, yung AAS and ICP could be comparable in terms of accuracy kasi may mga issues din tayo dun sa XRF eh. Kasi, ano, hindi, hindi, na, hindi mo dinadigest yung sample. So, uh, minsan, uh, may, may certain, ano lang eh, may certain depth lang yung surface na na-analyze niya. So, yun yung issue dun. And then, um, what technique is most cost efficient? So, kapag marami kang, ano, marami kang metals, mas okay ang ICP. Actually, depende rin yun sa paniningil ng lab, kung saan mo isa sa uh, yung sample mo. Pero kung balak mong bumili ng makina, it will be best to, ano, to purchase an ICP if you have five or more samples, or five or, or more analytes, five or more metals na ina-analyze, at, uh, all at the same time. And welcome po. Sorry, naka-mute po yata kayo. Sir Jeff. I'm sorry about that. Nawala yung ko para control panel ko sa Zoom. Okay. I think that's our last question okay. na capture namin dito sa slides. Pero meron pa dito kung meron pa dito ano, meron pa dito a couple of questions, sir. So ito naman, question yes. one, uh, from Sir Adinico Sarigao. So ang tanong naman niya is um, so does De La Salle University say offer operational say um instrument uh, manual seminar so for example um yung kumpara yung operation ng uh, iba't ibang mga instrumental instrumental um, analytical units say AAS mm. so, um, na, na medyo specific sir siguro sa brand ganyan meron ba kayong mga ganung klase ng activities More actually po ano uh, we we can offer yung ano broad lang na training Ibig sabihin, uh, training on the concepts, ganyan. We can, we can tell you about the concepts of the machine. In terms of hands-on, syempre, dahil pandemya pa rin tayo, medyo mahirap paggawin yan. Yeah. Pero, um, siguro, what we can do later on is um, we can um, perform trainings or facilitate trainings na specific dun sa mga makina meron tayo sa lab. Pero in terms of the, ano, yung binanggit na si Mads, so I, I, I believe you can, ano, you can message si Madso directly if you need ano if you need to help to contact them kasi may link pa rin naman ako sa kanila mga tao pa doon uh, and I can help you pero dapat po sa kanila kayo dumiret so kung very specific doon sa brand yung ano yung yung concern niya yung operation ng machine yung concern okay okay there's another question rin po um from um zoom so this one is from Shaira Javier ang question niya if we will be purchasing AES for fish and water sample analysis, what other facility slash equipment slash materials do we need to establish or purchase? Ito, nag, nagpahingi na po ng guidance si Ma'am. Paano ba mag-set up ng lab? <laughs> Sige po. Okay. Siguro, sana po may few hood na kayo kasi kailangan nyo siya. <laughs> Number one. And so, uh, ano ba mga kailangan bilhin? Uh, siguro, una, permit ng mga acids kasi yan yung pahirapan sa Pilipinas eh yung pagkuha ng permit sa ano sa PNP sa Kapidea kasi regulated nila yung nitric acid lalo eh nitric yung pinakamadalas na ginagamit for digestion what else um it really depends on your budget pero uh, you can purchase yung mga high ano high o, high temperature ovens na for for digestion yung mga muffle furnace if needed it really depends po then on your ano I, I believe it's best to ano, consult din po yung, ano, nyo, yung mga standard method na balak nyo gawin kasi it really depends on the nature of your lab. Kasi kung testing laboratory sa, uh, talagang kailangan yung sumunod dun sa mga guidelines na, ano, ng gobyerno. I mean, yung mga allowed methods nila. So you'll have to check uh, what are the uh, standard methods ng US EPA, SMU kanina, na, nakita nyo po, na ano ba yung mga makin ng ginagamit doon. Kasi yun yung mga bagay na kailangan nyo bilhin. Ayan po. Kasi baka mamaya, bumili po kayo ng mga makina na hindi pala approved. I mean, methods na hindi pala approved. Eh, sayang din yung inyong ano, pera. Ayan. Ayun. Okay, so may, ito naman, ano, message of appreciation naman to. Mabasa ko lang from... from Ay, sige po. Uh, sabi ko sa iyo, marami ka. Marami ka. <laughs> this is from Emily Koba. So, sabi niya, thank you, sir. It helped me a lot to recall what I have learned when I was a student 30 years ago. Oh. Wow. Uh, sir. Yeah, welcome, welcome po. Mas, mas, 
That's the Argamino impact. Okay, so meron pang maano, may trigger pa yung mga ano nato. We can entertain a couple more questions now before we cap the session po. Para in, para may uh, sapat na oras ang ating mga, para on time ang lunch ng ating mga uh, audience members. Okay, this one naman is um, from John Raymond D. Torres. So, good afternoon. Ay, hindi good afternoon. Ano ba yan? Biyernes na po. Pasensyahan niyo na po. Biyernes ang gabi po dito. Okay. Good day, Sir Argamino. I would like to know if it's possible for spectroscopic techniques to detect pesticide residue from plant tissues. Um, if it is possible, can you give an overview of how it should be done using technique? O, kasi ba, may sample prep. Nagtatanong na rin siya. Sige po. So, nauna po muna tanong, uh, ano po ba ang nature ng mga pesticide? So, mga pesticide po ay organic compounds in nature. And then, ang tanong next, kaya ba ng spectro? Ang atomic spectroscopy po, definitely hindi. Kasi, uh, very, ano sila, specific to elemental analysis. Metals, ganyan, most of the time. And some non-metals. So, pupunta naman tayo ngayon dun sa, ano, sa, ano, molecular spectroscopy techniques. We have yung, ano, UV, IR, saka yung, ano, yung fluorescence kanina, na no, discuss natin. So, Pwede nyo sigurong gamitin sila for identification, pero in terms of ano, quantification, kung mataas ang concentration, na kasi iso rin yan eh, kung gano'n ba kataas ang concentration. Pero kung tanong po, ano ba yung best technique na dapat gamitin para sa analysis ng mga pesticide residues? It would be, ano po, um, yung ating mga tawag dito, chromatography equipment, na i-discuss po ni Dr. Lazar na, and kailan po ba? Ito ka rin, in two months? Ano po ba, sir? January, January pa. At January pa, January pa. January pa. Ayun po. Kailangan January. po talaga niyong tumutok. Ang uh, tutok po kayo. Uh, Doon po ay didiscuss yung ano, uh, chromatography te- uh, sessions natin. Yung, yung, yung concept. So, ayun po. Alright. Okay. Ito naman. Question from Sir Marlo Fabia. Um, another question. So, ito naman. Um, I think this is this is more of an application type of question for environmental research. So, question is, sir, is relative to environmental research studies, what would be the priority area of focus based on its urgency and has impact? So, ano po ba yung mga environmental um, cases mm-hmm. na, 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 na worth um, you know uh, performing research activities on? Ayun po. Actually po, ano it, uh, yung worth it? parang hirap yung sagutin kasi sabang sabay-sabay po mga problema natin ngayon sa environmental issues eh. So siguro it would be ano po, it would be best if you can ano, if you can identify an issue within your area na gusto niyo talaga solusyunan. Kasi pag pinag-uusapan ba ating environment, we're pertaining to ano eh, um, developing ano, developing solutions to problems, environmental problems. So for example, tagasan po ba si sir? Ay, pwede po mong maitanong yan? Uh, para mas mabigyan tayo ng context. Si Sir, pa, si Sir Mal, Marlo rin yung tanong natin kanina na medyo mahihain mag, ano, magtanong ng live. Pero, so, bro, maganda, maganda, you raise a very important uh, point po. Kasi you know, like we also, uh, we, we also, you know, like train teachers and students when it comes to research and when it comes to topic ideation, you know, like yung locality, Uh, yung yung localities of yes. kasi doon talaga makaka-send pero may mm. impact ba diba? um timely and relevant doon sa revenue so maganda yung point and raise mo sir okay moving on this one one is from um Ar- Arian David so hi sir would just like to ask what are some coupled instruments that you have in CIF? Medyo ano siya, gusto niya ng ano, medyo mas complex na... Sige po, yan, <laughs> sagutin po natin yan. Kung coupled techniques po ang usapan, uh, kung sa spectroscopy lab na akin pong ano, hawak at the moment, we have an ICPMS na banggit ko sa kanina in passing, pero hindi ko siya binanggit in detail no, dun sa presentation. Pero we have an ICPMS which can be used for elemental analysis at the PPB to PPP level. And then for the chromatography lab naman, uh, Dr. Karen hopefully can also discuss this in a few months. And medyo mag-aantay lang po tayo. Um, we have a, a acute of LCMS. So, meron tayong SCM, uh, acute of LCMS. And then, meron din tayong GCMS. Ayun, yan po yung mga couple techniques natin. Tapos sa uh, microscopy naman po, meron tayong SEM EDS. So, in a few weeks, in a few days actually, i-discuss siya ni Dr. La, uh, Dr. Esmeria sa atin. Uh, okay. Alright, Karen, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, do you have any? Hindi man. Medyo ano na, 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 naka-mute pala si Karen. 
Dr. Lazar na. Dapat nahiya ba si Karen? O, o nawala, baka nawala si Karen. Okay. Okay, next question. So, ang dami pang, may, may mga pumapasa po. This one is from um, Zar Raymond Torres. So, okay, Sir Argamino, thanks for the pieces of information. Uh, ito message yata. I am actually into natural products research. So, thank you for the clarification. January 2022 pa, saying, sana po, mak, uh, ay, 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 yun, aabangan niya yung, ano, yung session ni, um, na, ni, uh, ni Ma'am Karen. Okay, nakamute, teka, teka. Karen, i-unmute kita. I don't know what's happening. Okay, Karen. Um, did... Hello. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was logged out kanina. And so, uh-huh. yeah. Uh, taking note of your questions. So, as Chris has mentioned, um, we have an LCMS and a UHP LCQ TOF for um, high resolution mass spectrometer, um, I, um, high accuracy, high mass accuracy identification of compounds. So it's very much applicable for analyzing mga organic contaminants, mga pollutants. And also, as uh, mentioned also, we have a GCMS, uh, which is also used quite frequently for pollutants analysis, pesticides analysis. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'll try to cover that uh, in my um, webinar. Yun. Thank you. Ayun, okay. Uh, so, abangan nyo po. So, sabi nga namin, simula kayong buwan ng September hanggang January 2022, itong ating webinar series with De La Salle University um, uh, CIF. So, ayun po. Okay, so, I, I think we have already done all of the questions. So, but you know, um, um, Dr. Dindivoyle has something to share. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chris, and all, to all our participants. So, bago po natin uh, tapusin ang ating webinar this morning, I would like to present this Certificate of Appreciation to Mr. Chris Argamino from De La Salle University for delivering the webinar Atomic and Molecular Spectroscopy for Environmental Research, organized by the Filipino Science Hub and held via Zoom and YouTube Live on the 25th day of September 2021, given this 25th day of September 2021, signed by our CEO and founder, Dr. Jeffrey Camacho Bonkin, and our Vice President, Mr. JP Anya. So again, po, marami yes. salamat, Sir Chris. Marami po kami natutunan. Thank you, po. Marami po Thank you, po. See you guys. <laughs> Ayo. So, so um uh, actually but uh, uh, sir sir Chris um and then Karen since you're also already um um in the session meron meron bang mga information that you would like to still share about um um your organization or your institution at De La Salle? Sige po. So, so muna po muna sa maraming sala. Ay sige po. So, Karen ko kalo muna. Sige po, kayo muna. <laughs> Masyado po silang mababait. <laughs> Masyado po silang magagalang. Ayun, sige po. Ayun po. So, Karen, uh, bali ano? Karen, yan dito. I don't know why. Ayun. <laughs> Ayun po. Okay. Ay, sorry. Uh, so, um, with regards nga sa uh, DLSU-CIF, so, Again, we have uh, several analytical instrumentation to offer, uh, ranging from spectroscopy, as Chris has covered, chromatography, um, uh, electron microscopy, as well as um, uh, cell culture and um, cytogenetic analysis. And so we're very much uh, um, happy to, to collaborate, to, to serve um, the analytical needs of um, researchers uh, here in the Philippines. So please do contact us at CIF, uh, CIF at dlsu.edu.ph if you have uh, inquiries, if you want to know more about our services and to collaborate. So, yun. Uh, Chris? Ayun. Sir Chris. Ayun po. Uh, Dagdag ko lang po. Uh, since ako yung humahawak ng social media ng CIF, ayan, pakilike naman po ang ano, DLSU Central Instrumentation Facility sa Facebook. At meron din po kami yung YouTube, uh, YouTube page. So, yung mga, I'm not sure if you're familiar na meron din po kami webinars in the past. Pero if you want to check them out, we, these are all uploaded on our YouTube channel. So, just uh, search nyo lang po yung ano, 
Ah uh, DLSU type ko na lang po ah. DLSU Central Implementation Sorry, Instrumentation So, search na lang po yan both Facebook and YouTube. So, andun po lahat ng detalye. Uh, email addresses, events, etc. So, andun po lahat. Thank you. Alright. So, bale, yun pong links para po sa link para po sa Google sa Google form para makakuha kayo ng e-certificate of attendance uh, ay nasa Zoom chat box na po at nasa uh, YouTube uh, live chat box. So, um, ano lang po, reminder lang po para sa inyong lahat na nagsasubmit since um, ang atin pong um, certificate generation is auto uh, automated. Um, kung ano, please be mindful po of yung spelling ng inyong email addresses at ng inyong mga pangalan. Kasi kung ano man po yung i-submit nyo sa Google Form, yun lang din po yung information and na, 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 na re-reflect doon sa inyong e-certificate. So, and then, since we also um, uh, are, under, are on the receiving end of hundreds um, and some, sometimes thousands of requests for certificates of participation, so medyo ano po, please bear with us. Um, if um, siguro po tumagal ng more than 10 days na hindi nyo po matanggap via email, so siguro po after 10 days i-follow up nyo po sa amin para po mabigay namin sa inyo. Okay, and I'm also sharing po kasi may nag-request kanina, um, paki-flash daw po ulit ng mga dates. So markahan nyo po ito. Today, September 25th is yung kay Sir Chris. October 9th, kay Sir Jose, es uh, kay Dr. Jose Esmira Jr. Um, um, ito naman po, um, in, um, scanning electron microscopy. November 27th, NMR spectroscopy for natural products research by Dr. Virgilio Ver Ver Ebajo. December 4th, um, Mr. Michael Arnante, he'll talk about multi-species cytogenetic um, cyto genetic analysis and then January 15th birthday ng nanay ko um, um, um uh, Dr. Anna Karen Lasser na um, liquid chromatography instrumentation and applications in natural products research ayon so maraming malam maraming salamat po ulit you know sa mga guru po dito kung gusto niyo introduce yung uh, molecular at atomic spectroscopy you know ito pong youtube video ito pong um, webinar ni sir chris argamino is uploaded on our youtube channel so pwede niyo din po itong panoorin kasi may mga humihipo ng ano ng um, copy ng uh, presentation so i think it's much better po pupuntahin niyo lang po dun sa youtube video kasi at least doon um, as they see the, the as they watch the, as they view the slides nagle-lecture si sir chris at meron pong rewind at uh, um, repeat uh, buttons dun. So, ayun. Muli, maraming maraming salamat po sa pagsama na naman ninyo sa amin sa isang uh, Sabado na puno-puno ng pagkatuto. So, um, next week po, um, actually, ang event po, meron po tayo sa September 30th. Ito nga pala po, yun sa PNU. So, ayun. Maraming maraming salamat po. Uh, oras na po ng panahalian para sa inyo. So, uh, magkita-kita po ulit tayo sa um, mga dates na na, na specified dito so, and we would we would like to thank um De La Salle University um, um for for you know for working with Filipino Science Hub and you know like sharing generously sharing their expertise more particularly sa modern analytical techniques so so ito po kasi uh, on the context of research naman po para sa ating mga high school at teachers at students ito pong mga techniques na it deliver ng mga taga Dela sa University ang mga sobrang nagagamit when it comes to research. So, ayun. Maraming maraming salamat po uli sa inyong lahat. Um, and then, you know, if you uh, have questions po, um, I, I believe um, si Sir Chris nagpakita rin, ng, um, nagbigay siya ng contact information ng uh, DLSU CIF. So, yun po. Alright, maraming maraming salamat po. And then Sir Chris and Karen, uh, we would like to invite you to, uh, to a debriefing after this in, in a separate session. So maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo lahat. Um, patuloy po kayong mag-ingat and we'll see you again po dun sa mga susunod na dates, okay? Maraming salamat po. Alright.